here we are with day nine of advent of code and today's problem involves ropes and knots in the ropes so basically there's there's some story here we're falling off a rope bridge so i don't know something's going on there but anyways the thing we're trying to do from a programming perspective is we have uh these knots in our rope so they're represented with h is the head t is the tail and the head sort of moves throughout a two-dimensional space based on these directions. This is our puzzle input, and the tail has to follow it in a particular way. So if the head moves horizontal, the tail will then follow it horizontally. But uh, if the head gets away from it diagonally, then the tail must uh, the tail must also follow it diagonally. Something like that. So uh, basically. What we're doing for this problem is just tracking the number of spaces that the tail uh, goes through. And the first part, we just have the head and then one tail knot. What changes in the second part is that we have a whole bunch of tail knots. I think we have as many as, uh, I think it's, it's 10. There's the head and then nine tails. And again, we want to track the position of the final tail. Uh, but it's always sort of the same input where the head, the, these are the directions, so the head moves right five spaces, it moves up eight spaces, left eight spaces, down three spaces, etc, etc. Et so uh, when, I, when, when I did the first part in isolation, I wrote up a slightly different solution uh, than the one I'm going to show, but I, I, I realized when writing the second part, it's like, okay, this solution is generalizable, so... I tweak things a little bit, but we can start off just by parsing our input. So each of these lines is just, okay, it's a character and a number. So we just choose the different characters. We parse them into moves, up, right, down, left. And uh, we just replicate that based on the number of times from the move. And we can cat all that together. So we get, uh, we, we parse our complete list of moves. So. Now, how do we actually solve this problem? Well, there are three parts uh, to this problem. So first of all, the most basic part is given the previous position of the head and the move we're doing, we have to give the next uh, head coordinate. This is very obvious. We move up, the X goes up by one. I'm treating the X as the row and the Y as the column, even though that's you know not Cartesian, but whatever. Uh, so, you know, we move up, x goes, x increases, right, y increases, etc. That's sort of the easy part. Uh, the harder part, obviously we're going to want a function that basically given the location of the head, the new location of the head, and the previous location of the tail, we have to calculate, okay, where does the tail go now? And there are a bunch of different cases with this. Uh, but as long as you sort of enumerate the different cases uh, and keep track of everything, it's actually not too bad, uh, but it can be a little overwhelming if you're trying to do the problem quickly. Um, but there are a bunch of cases where the tail doesn't actually move, so if the head remains basically in one of the eight spaces next to the tail, anywhere, anywhere around it actually doesn't move. So that's our first case, tail does not move at all. If, uh, if they're on the same row, so the same sort of what I'm calling the x-coordinate, uh, then Obviously, the x coordinate will stay the same, but then the tail might move closer to the head. Well, it will move closer to the head. The question is, are we adding one or subtracting one? Uh, that just depends on whether or not uh, the column is smaller or bigger for the tail. Uh, so we do that case for if their x's are equal, we do the similar thing if their y's are equal. And now we have to think about the diagonal sorts of cases. So uh, I, I call these q1 q2 q3 for the cartesian quad or sorry the cartesian quadrants uh, so even though i'm flipping x and y with respect to the cartesian plane uh, i still used these references so q1 means uh, i believe so the head is up and to the right of the tail so we add one to each of the coordinates for the tail and we just repeat the process and so all of these are just guards these are the conditions we set out you know head of x is greater than tail x head of y is greater than tail of y that's the q1 condition similar for q2 and q3 uh, and this is q4 so this will give us the new coordinate for uh, one tail knot uh, compared to the one that is following and 
it's really good that we can reuse this function. So I, I originally wrote this for the first part, but we can reuse it in the second part because each successive tail in the rope will follow the previous tail. So or so it will look at, uh, you know, it will treat the other, I guess, the previous tail as its head. So they all follow the same rules, which is very convenient as we start to write a folding function that will actually fold through each move and determine uh, how the whole not basically, or the whole the whole rope, how it updates. So what are we folding over? What's the state that we're tracking? Well, we need to track the set of coordinates. This is the um, all of the places where the last knot uh, goes, because that's our, our final answer is going to be the size of this set. So we'll uh, you know we'll take that as an input and return it as an output. We also just take the list of coordinates that are the knots themselves. This updates from step to step, and it's our input and our output. Uh, so we can essentially parameterize our initial state just by the number of knots. In the first part, uh, we par parameterize it with 2, in the second it's 10. It's the only real difference between the, the first part and the second part. And now we can write this folding function. So we're incorporating a single move, right, left, up, down. Uh, and how do we do this? Well, we have to basically loop through all of the knots in... Uh, in the rope, and there's a little bit of error handling here, like, okay, if we have no knots, then, you know, we just, it's kind of an error, but uh, just return the previous values, uh, because we're gonna call head and tail here, so we wanna identify that case. Now, uh, we're gonna write this recursive function, hard fold tail, so this takes two lists of coordinates as its arguments. One of these is the accumulated knots, uh, that we've already processed, and then the second is just the remaining knots that we still have to process. So when we initialize this, the first thing we do is we use the next head function on the head of our knots, applied to the move. This, tell, this gives us our first new location, the location of the head. Remember, this was that first function we wrote. And then we'll initially pass the tail of that list for the second argument. Now again, error case, this should never come up. But I like to be thorough, and my IDE will yell at me if I am not thorough about these cases. So, uh, next case, we uh, these are the knots that are finished, and we have an empty list for what's remaining, so we just return uh, the list that is done. And now we have our recursive case. So, uh, we have the head knot, or the one we're treating as the head knot that's in front of this list, and then we have the next knot that we're processing compared to the rest. Uh, all we do, we use our next tail function with all these cases. That gives us the new location, and we just append that to what is done in front, because we're going to use that new not location as the head for the next recursive run. And yes, that's what we're doing. We're making a recursive call here uh, with the rest. And that's all we have to do here. Uh, well, actually, not quite. We're almost done. So we get our new locations, but remember we've accumulated these in reverse, so the head of the uh, of, of the list is now at the back, uh, and the uh, the final tail, the final knot, is in the front of this list, which is convenient because now we want to insert uh, the head of the new locations into our final list, or in, into the previous list, so this gives us an updated list, and we just reverse these locations. And that's pretty much all there is to it. We just call this fold, we get our final set, and we get its final size, and that's basically it. So, anyway run my test cases. These are the ones I had. Uh, so 13 for that first one, and then we get you know a few thousand on the on the larger example. Two thousand there's two thousand lines of moves, which means we're probably doing, you know, some of these are as many as like almost twenty moves. So we're we're actually processing like tens of thousands of moves. So um, not uncommon for us to get that. Oh, I forgot to remove some log statements, so that's interesting. <laughs> well, I will be sure to do that, but that is our solution for day nine. So hope you enjoy this video. Make sure to subscribe to Monday Morning Haskell uh, mailing list. That video is, or that link is in the video description. And uh, keep coming back to this channel. We'll have uh, new solutions for Advent of Code, hopefully every day, as long as I've got time this month. All right, thanks for watching. Have a good day.